I apologize for interrupting this worshipful beginning. Um, but the Women's Council has asked me to make an important announcement. If you're considering attending the women's trip to Branson, we need registrations turned into headquarters or Brandy Lasco uh, by September 1st. We currently have 10 spots still available. The reason we have a deadline is because the extra tickets to the play, Jesus, needs to be canceled by September 7th in order to get a refund. We are also planning meals and a final count would be very helpful. Thank you. soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful, wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed, and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, since we have been in his care. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful, wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful, wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I wish to greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The men up here in front have come here this day to provide ministry. We call this a worship service, and in many ways, worship is your response to what God has done for you, and is something that you as individuals, we as individuals, can or cannot participate in. Just because we have come here this morning does not mean that we will worship. But if in your mind you 
prepare yourself or consider those times in the ministry that Christ has provided for you, you will worship. So I invite you to come and worship in song and scripture reading and the ministry of the spoken word as we go through this morning. There is one change in your bulletin. It says the welcome and call to worship is by Jack Evans. Um, that's not correct. <laughs> that's me. I'm not Jack. But we did have seven chairs set up here this morning, and we thought in the back, well, we'll just leave that chair for Christ. So if he wants to come and sit in the seventh chair over here this morning, he's more than welcome to come and join us this morning. So I am providing the welcome and the call to worship. And to do that, I would like to read from the third chapter of the book of Alma. Printed is verse 25. I'm going to go just a little beyond that. And behold, he preached the word unto your fathers, and a mighty change was also wrought in their hearts. And they humbled themselves and put their trust in the true and living God. And behold, they were faithful until the end, therefore they were saved. And now behold, I ask you, my brethren of the church, have you been spiritually born of God? Have ye received his image in your countenances? Have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Do ye exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality and this corruption raised in incorruption to stand before God? to be judged according to the deeds which have been done in this mortal body. And I say unto you, can you imagine to yourselves that ye hear the voice of the Lord saying unto you in that day, come unto me ye blessed, for behold, your works have been the works of righteousness upon the face of the earth. Or do ye imagine to yourselves that you can lie unto the Lord in that day and say, Lord, our works have been righteous works upon the face of the earth, and that he will save you. I say unto ye, can ye look up to God at that day with a pure heart and clean hands? Let us continue in our worship this morning as we contemplate the Savior and what he has done for us. As we sing together hymn number 330.
Holy and Eternal Heavenly Father, we've just sung such a beautiful hymn of how much we love you and pray to you and how much you love us. And we come before thee humbly with our broken hearts and contrite spirits with a great, great desire for you to be with us today and abide with us, even with us in the chair. We know this gospel is the gospel of truth and light and love and mercy and grace. And we thank you for he who will speak to us today, even thine apostle. We pray mightily that we would be attuned to your voice in our hearts and in our minds, that we might walk closer with thee because of the experience we have this hour. We give thee the honor, the glory, and the praise, and ask thee to come, be with us, and we will worship thee in Jesus' sacred and most holy name. Amen. If you were here for the uh, the family worship this morning, I, I think you'll find that me and Brandy were led to share similar thoughts this morning, and I don't think that that's a, uh, a coincidence. But this morning, I'd like to share a, a quick story with you. And normally you hear this story around Easter, and I'm sure many of you have heard it before. But I think the message is, is always appropriate. And this is also a very long story, uh, so I've condensed it a lot. Um, a lot's going to be left out, so just bear with me. Uh, there was a professor of religion named uh, Dr. Christensen, and he'd been having trouble communicating the essence of the gospel to his class. And this class was required for students to graduate, so many students just viewed it as just drudgery. Now, Dr. Christensen, he had a, a student named Steve, in one of his classes. And Steve was one of the best students, and he was also the starting center for the school's football team. So he was really in shape. Um, and eventually, the professor came up with a plan to engage the rest of the class, but he needed Steve's help. So he approached him uh, after class one day, and he asked him how many push-ups he could do, you know, since he was on the football team. And Steve said he did about 200 every night. So the professor asked him if he thought he could do 300. And Steve said he thought he could, so the professor said uh, it was for a class project, and, and he told him what his plan was. About a week later, the professor showed up to this class uh, with a big box of donuts. Without any explanation, he walked up to the first student in the first row and asked if they wanted a donut. And the student said that they would, so the professor turned to Steve and asked him to do 10 push-ups. Steve did them quickly, and the professor gave the student a donut. Now, that process continued on throughout the first row. The professor then moved on to the second row and began asking the same question. Eventually, a student replied, no, I don't want a donut. So the professor turned and asked Steve to do 10 push-ups for a donut that wasn't wanted. Steve did the push-ups as asked. More and more of the students began declining the donut, not wanting to cause Steve any more pain than he'd already endured, but each time, the professor asked Steve to do 10 push-ups. And that's where I'm really going to stop the story because it, it just kind of goes on pretty long from there. But um, by, the end, by the time the story ends, Steve does about 350 push-ups, and he collapses from exhaustion. And the lesson that the professor was trying to teach was Christ's sacrifice for all of us. And by the end of it, you know, the, the students understand what he was trying to tell them. Now, I told you all that so I could tell you this. Um, I can be a very aggressive driver at times. Um, it's one of my many faults, and sometimes whenever somebody cuts me off, I'll think, you know, who does this person think they are? <clears throat> and more and more after I have those thoughts in my head, I hear, Dave, Jesus died for their sins, just the same as he died for yours. And I instantly think back to this story that I just read you. He loves them the same as he loves me. 
Satan's trying to turn us against our brothers and our sisters in almost every aspect of our lives. We need each other if Zion is to succeed. No matter what differences we have, we all share the Master's love. I'm going to leave you with a scripture that we all probably know by heart, but it's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We uh, provide this opportunity at every service for us to consider what God has done for us in a way of financial resources and material resources and ask you to consider what you might like to give back to the, the church and to his work, the church. Uh, if the deacons would pass amongst us, then I'll have you return with the offering and will say a blessing upon it. Let us pray together. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we have before us gifts of financial resources and gifts from the hearts of these people that we wish to place at the altar that you have given us. Each and one of us is aware, Father, that uh, you have given us much, and we would return all unto you. Father, we would ask a blessing upon these gifts that they might uh, go to strengthen the church, provide for the material resources that uh, we need to maintain the ministry and the work. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Scripture reasoning that I have for you is from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 46.4, and from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It says, Beware lest ye be deceived, and that ye may not be deceived. Seek ye earnestly the best gifts, always remembering for what they are given. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer with meekness and fear to every man that asketh of you a reason for the hope that is in you.
What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread, what have I to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms? I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Do you love the Lord? I definitely do. This day is another one of those marvels to me because of the way that things have been orchestrated so far. I got a call from President Patience a few days ago to ask me about uh, the scripture reading, whether I was going to follow the uh, uh, bulletin or the suggested scriptures or theme that we were going to be uh, having today. And I had to confess to him, I had no idea what the theme was. I didn't have the list. so. When he told me that it was going to be in the midst of distractions, focus on the gospel, I was like, great, that's perfect, because that follows right along with what the Lord had done for me in my preparations. I've got to tell you, when I got the assignment for today, I had some things in my mind that I wanted to preach on, but I really couldn't focus my thoughts on those things when I sat down to try and put some notes down on paper. So I kind of resisted that, and it took me, oh gosh, a week, week and a half to finally say, okay, I'm going to take myself down into my man cave, and I'm going to dedicate my time to... To the Lord and, and figure out what it is that he wants me to preach. And when I finally decided on what I was going to preach, it, it just came so rapidly. And I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate it even more when I hear this theme fits right, uh, right along with it. And then I come to church and sit in the class today, and many of the things that, that was discussed in the class today, you're going to hear again in this message. But in keeping with the scripture reading, I want to share with you a story from 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7, and the story speaks of a time when the Syrian army had invaded the northern kingdom of Israel, and this was during the times of uh, the prophet Elisha, and the Lord had revealed to Elisha where the army was going to attack, so Elisha sent servants to the king of Israel and warned him not to travel to that particular area, and the Syrian king became frustrated because every time his armies tried to move throughout Israel, somebody knew where they were going. And he even suspected that one of his men was betraying him and letting the Israelites know. But one of his servants convinced him, hey, it's got to be Elisha. It's got to be this prophet of Israel that's making known what you're telling people in secret. So the king sent spies out to find out where Elisha was. And when the word got back to him that he was in Dotham, the king of Syria sent his armies out in the middle of the night and surrounded the city and besieged it. And when Elisha's servant woke up the next morning and saw that they were surrounded by the Syrian army. He was scared, and he cried out to Elisha and said, What's going to happen to us? And Elisha spoke to him in chapter 6, verse 16, 2 Kings, and said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. But the armies of Israel were not in Dotham. So who was Elisha talking about when he said there's more with us than there are with the Syrians? He wasn't talking about men. 
So when he saw his servant's confusion, Elisha prayed to the Lord and he asked him to open his servant's eyes so he could see what Elisha saw himself. And when the young man looked, he saw that the mountains were covered with the heavenly host on horses and chariots of fire. Can you imagine seeing that? And then Elisha prayed and he asked the Lord to blind the eyes of the Syrian army. And when that was done, he went forward in the midst of them and he said, you're in the wrong place, but I'll lead you to the man that you're looking for. Even himself, right? But Elisha led them into Samaria and delivered them over into the hands of the king of Israel. And the king of Israel in his excitement thought to kill him. But Elisha admonished him and told the king, give them bread and water instead. And then he told the king to send them home. But sometime after that, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, sent his armies back into Israel, and this time they besieged Samaria and locked the king and the people inside the walls of the city. And I want you to imagine what that would be like to have your city surrounded by an enemy force that's besieging you to the degree where you can't go out and you can't buy food, you can't bring in supplies, you can't even go out into the forest to bring back wood for fires. Imagine what that would be like. It would be horrible. And the story says that the people and the animals within the walls of the city were starving to death. And it was so bad that they were spending incredible sums of money to buy things that they would never eat, even excrement. And because of this, that's not even the worst of it. So a woman cried unto the king of Israel and asked him for help. And the king said, what's the, what's the problem? And this woman complained that she had entered into an agreement with another woman to eat each other's sons. But when it, was, when it was the other woman's turn to share her son or have her son boiled, she hit him. Imagine that. Imagine what a scene that must have been. What madness could possess a mother to do such a thing? And it's incomprehensible to us because we've never experienced that kind of desperation, that kind of hunger, and I pray that we never do. But the story says that when the king heard this, he rent his clothes and he walked in sackcloth, but in his anger he blamed Elisha. And he sought to take off Elisha's head. Because you remember it wasn't long before this that the, king, the armies of the Syrians were delivered into his hands. He could have killed them and this, besiege, this siege would have never happened. But you've got to remember it wasn't long before this that the Lord had told his people in Deuteronomy chapter 28 all the promises that he had given to Israel. He says, so long as the people hearken unto my voice and keep my commandments, then I'll set them high above all nations. And he would smite any nation that rose up against them, and that he would bless their hands and everything that they did, and they would want for nothing. But this story was during a time where the northern kingdom of Israel was steeped in iniquity and they would not repent. This is the same time right after Elijah and his dealings with King Ahab and Jezebel. But they would not repent. So all the promises of God that he extended towards his people and towards their lands were being revoked. And the Syrians were God's means of chastisement in hopes that they would repent and turn again unto the Lord their God. And the king should have known this. He should have recognized what was happening and repented. But he swore in his anger to kill Elisha. But Elisha foresaw what was coming, and he had his would-be assassin detained outside the door of his house when he came to take him. And Elisha prophesied to this young man, said, On the morrow, within the gates of this city, a measure of fine flour will be sold for a shekel, and so would two measures of barley, signifying that the famine was about to come to an end. But the king's servant doubted him. And Elisha told him, you're going to see it with your own eyes, but you're not going to partake of it. And I want to share with you uh, what's written next in 2 Kings chapter 7. It says, there was four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine's in the city and we shall die. And if we, stay, if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. But if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the uttermost part of the camp of the Syria, behold, there was no man. For the Lord, listen to this, 
For the Lord had made the hosts of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even a noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to come on us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was. And they fled for their life. And when the lepers heard this, when they came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither the voice of men, but horses tied, and asses tied, and tents as they were. This news was brought to the king, but he didn't believe it. He thought that the Syrians had laid a trap to get them to open up the gates of the city and to draw them out. But his servants convinced him to send men to see for themselves, and they found it exactly as the lepers had told them. The tru truly, the Syrians had fled, leaving behind everything. And the story goes on to say that the people rushed out and spoiled the camp of the Syrians, and took of all that they had. And so it was that a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according as the word had said. And as for the man that the king of Israel sent to kill Elisha, he was given the charge over the gate of the city, and the people trod him down and he died, just as Elisha had, had prophesied. And I tell you this story, saints, because the armies of darkness are gathering their strength and encircling and besieging God's people all over the earth. And we're witnessing, if you've been watching what's going on in the world, we're witnessing throughout the entire world those who would take away our freedom. We're witnessing a growing divide between those who cherish freedom and those who would take it. We're witnessing a fevered effort to strip away all that is of God in our history. And I'm going to keep warning you folks, it doesn't take much for you to look around the earth and see that the Lord's judgment is being poured out upon mankind and on the earth itself. Because we're witnessing historic droughts all over the earth. Plagues, multiple plagues at once, pestilences, violent weather events, flooding, woes of every kind, and the sounds of war echoing, echoing in the east and in the west. And make no mistake, there is a very real famine that's about to sweep this earth. It's even at our doorstep, saints, and I hope you've been preparing for it. But saints, these things should not be. Not now. Not after the Lord came to give us the gospel of salvation. Not after he gave his life to put an end to sin and death. The power thereof. But so it is. And these things are happening because the nations of men have turned away from the ways of the Lord. Just as the northern kingdom of Israel had done in this story. And the first consequence of this is a famine of the spirit. And it's followed by the judgments of God. But you know, I can excuse the Syrian army in this case, or at least extend some mercy towards them, because they didn't know the God of Abraham. They weren't part of the covenant. Their hatred towards Israel was taught to them from their youth, just like the Lamanites were taught to hate the Nephites, right, in the Book of Mormon. And I can also extend a level of mercy towards the people of today, because so many of them have been brainwashed, and too few of them have been here in churches learning of God and of salvation. And I think all of you know how I feel by now if you've heard me speak. Christians aren't innocent in this matter. We've either ignored the signs or we were asleep while the wicked over the last 50 years have done everything that they can to dismantle our right to express our faith openly. To express our belief that it's only in and through obedience to the word of God that mankind will ever know peace. So we find ourselves in the midst of a growing spiritual famine. And if we don't recognize this and repent, saints, if we don't help the world recognize this and repent, then the Spirit of God will altogether depart from us and mankind will continue to descend into greater and greater iniquity and the love of man will fail. 
So we as saints, we of this church have a great responsibility. And it's one that ought to excite the hearts and imaginations of every one of us. We cannot give ourselves over to fear and refrain from speaking God's word. God's word is truth. Because it does not matter how much you might be hated. It doesn't matter how much you might be despised because of your beliefs. Christ was hated first. But that did not stop him from embracing that cross and atoning for our sins. He loved us too much, and that's the love that every one of us ought to have for every person on this planet, no matter how vile or offensive they may be. It is their eternal soul that we should be concerned with, even as Jesus was concerned with the eternal soul of every one of us. He promised, did he not, that he would be with us to the end? It doesn't matter whether we're hated. He's there with us. We need only believe and stay ourselves on God's promise because the battle is his. And if you remember in this story, it was the Lord that thundered through the mountains with the sounds of the hooves and chariots that drove the Syrian army away in terror. But I want to talk more about what happened next because it says it was the lepers that discovered this great miracle. And it's interesting to me that God chose them to reveal it to his people because the lepers were the despised of Israel. They weren't allowed to live within the city because of their disease and people looked down on them and were afraid to come near them because they thought they might be infected. In this, in this story, during the whole crisis, they were left to sit outside the city. Even then, they were made to sit outside the city. They were starving just like everybody else. So these lepers decided, you know what? Let's just go to the Syrians. Maybe they'll let us live. If we stay here, we're just going to die. So they got up and they went to the Syrian camp and found it completely abandoned. The flight of the Syrians was in such haste that they left everything behind, and the, and the lepers went into the tents and ate and drank. Then they carried away the gold, silver clothing and hid it for themselves. And then they realized, hey, what we're doing is not right. It's not right for us to keep these things for ourselves because God had broke that famine with the food and the drink of their enemy. He'd even given them their horses, their asses, their clothes, their riches was not right for them to keep that for themselves. So they went and told it to the porter within the gate, and all the people rushed out and spoiled the camp. And I bring these lepers up because I can't help but compare them with our Latter-day Church. From the moment that Joseph Smith Jr. shared the angel message with that Methodist minister, he became an outcast, despised of all of the churches of his day and chased from place to place. His name's been had for good or evil ever since, just as Moroni prophesied that it would be. And in the early latter days, or in the early days of this church, believers in the Book of Mormon and the Latter-day Message were beaten. They were tarred and feathered. Their homes were stolen from them. Their lands taken. Families, entire families, were murdered. And they were chased out of Missouri and from place to place all because they believe that God speaks and interacts with mankind today just as he did in the days of the past. And because we believe that Christ manifested himself in the flesh in this hemisphere too, to the peoples here, not just in the lands of Israel. Indeed, we do believe. And because we believe, we're still looked upon as if we're lepers or a cult that's dangerous in some way, con contagious, and has to be separated from other Christians. But it's really not that strange a thing when you think about what happened to the apostles and the early Christians. Their doctrine was far too controversial for the Pharisees and the Sadducees liking, and it was far too rigid for idolaters. But none suffered greater violence and hardships than they did, and it took 300 years for that to change under the rule of Constantine the Great. But in the pre presentation that I gave you of the body of Christ during the last summer series, you saw a visual representation of how the gospel was changed by the Roman church. You saw how the Roman church eliminated certain priesthood offices and invented new ones. You saw how that pattern continued with the Protestant and the Reformation movements and how it's continued with all of the Christian churches who claim their authority through the Roman church. But most importantly, you saw how the body's direct connection with God through Christ was severed. And prophetic ministry was denied. And where I'm going with this is that despite the way that people may look at us or what they may think about the Book of Mormon, we believe that this is the true church of Jesus Christ. 
We believe that the body of Christ has been fitly joined together again. And that all of the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit has been restored. We believe that through the Melchizedek priesthood and the ordinances of the church, the power of God is manifested on the earth again. Prophetic and revelatory ministry has revealed much of the mysteries of the kingdom and how it is that we're supposed to establish it in these last days. So whether the world can see it right now or not, whether we can see it in some degree, we are the beneficiaries of great spiritual treasure. But like the lepers in this story, we're not sharing it with the world like we should. We've been distracted. Ever since the apostasy of the 1980s, the work of building up the kingdom has all but ground to a halt, and that's because far too many people have given themselves over to arguing over doctrine and authority. The body is divided again and again, and that's led to our own degree of spiritual famine, and it shouldn't be. There are many of you sitting out there that can remember a time where the thus saith the Lord of the gifts of prophecy or tongues or great healings, or even visitations of angels, angels was commonplace in our congregations throughout many lands. But it isn't so today, not like it was. And I want to share a dream that I had in 2009 while Katrina and I were in Guatemala, because it speaks to this particular condition. In the dream, there was an older man and I that were on a mission, an urgent mission to recover something that was very important, but we were captured by an enemy that took on the form of Nazi soldiers. And we were blindfolded and flown to a prison camp that looked just like a concentration camp that you would see in World War II. It had the high towers with the machine gunners on it. It had the high fences with the, the razor wire across the top. And it had soldiers everywhere. And they took us to a lapside shack and they shoved us inside and locked the door. But the inside of this shack was not what you expect. It was filled with Victorian furniture. It was very elegant, and it even had a wet bar. But all my companion and I wanted to do was get out of there and get to the place that we were originally headed. So we crafted explosives out of thin air, and we planted them all over the inside of this shack. And then we ran from the shack, took cover along the fence, waiting for the explosion. But I noticed there were no guards anywhere to be seen. And then I saw a map laying on the ground next to us that showed us exactly where we were. And to my horror, we were right where we were supposed to be. We were about to blow up the place that we were supposed to be. So we ran back inside and we put out the fuses. And that's when our eyes were truly open to what this shack, this place, contained. It was filled with priceless objects. Objects that we were sent to retrieve for the peoples of the world, for everyone. And the first thing that I picked up was a large jar. It was sitting on top of the bar table, and it was filled with some type of grain. And I started to pour that out, and inside this jar was an ancient papyrus book. And I flipped through the pages, and it was filled with an un unknown writing that I couldn't, couldn't read, didn't recognize the characters from any languages that I knew. And I handed that off to my companion, and I went about looking through this shack at the different objects that were there. But I was confronted by a man dressed in all black and a woman with gray hair that exuded evil. And every attempt that I made to pick up one of those objects to examine it or to take it was met with resistance, particularly by the woman who said that those things belonged to her. Despite all my arguments that those things belong to the people, they belong to you. Saints, the place that we were trying to get in this dream was Zion. It was the kingdom where the house or our church is supposed to be filled with the, with the treasures of heaven and to be endowed with the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, yet for decades now. Satan's managed to blindfold many of the saints and convince them that they were headed in the wrong direction. And arguments over doctrine and issues of authority have fragmented the body just like a bomb is blown up in our midst. We have got to find a way to put down our weapons. We have got to find a way to extinguish those fuses and realize that all of us were led to the same place. This is the center place. Zion, the faithful city. We've got to find a way to pull off those spiritual blindfolds and stop listening to the whisperings of Satan. 
who wants us to either keep those treasures for ourselves or prevent us from obtaining them. Either way, he wins. And I can tell you that that condition is not going to change unless each of us takes responsibility for our own relationship with the Lord. And we seek his face in disciplined study, fasting, and prayer. Because every one of us, every one of us must have our own conversion experience. It is essential to helping us understand what part we play in the building up of the kingdom. And at a minimum, at a minimum, every member of this church has a responsibility to witness for Jesus Christ and the kingdom in every place. But you can't be a light under the world if you don't have any oil. Like the foolish virgins that were sent away at the last moment to buy their own. You buy your oil through study, through prayer, through fasting, through developing your relationship with Jesus Christ and then putting it into practice. Walk uprightly before the Lord. It is an inescapable truth that all of us must go to the seller and buy. And who is the seller? Who's the seller? It is Jesus. Jesus is the seller, and the best thing is, he tells us in Isaiah 55 and in 2 Nephi chapter 11, Come, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. He wants to fill you, but you have to seek him out diligently if you want to receive. And saints, I have to ask this question. Do you believe that this is the true church of Jesus Christ? Do you? If you do, then I beg you in the name of Jesus, settle that in your mind. Settle it. Don't allow yourselves to be distracted by what the world might say or other churches might say about us or about what we believe in, this Book of Mormon and Latter-day Revelation. Don't let it distract you. It does not change our mission what they might say about us. The only way that we will ever convince anyone who we are and whose we are is by our fruit. Action. Shouting about it isn't going to convince anything, anyone. It's only going to keep us in bondage and prevent us from focusing on the things that lie before us. And didn't Christ tell us not to contend with any other church other than the church of the devil? He did. So it really bothers me when ministry or even the hand of fellowship is denied someone simply because they attend another church group or another restoration group. We've got to find a way to overcome that. But you know what really bothers me the most, above all things, is when I hear someone intimate that the people of other Christian faiths will have no part in Zion or in the building up of God's temple here on earth. Shame on you if that's the way you feel. Didn't the Lord chastise the apostles for wanting to stop a stranger from performing miracles in the name of Jesus? You'll find that in Luke chapter 9, verses 49 and 50. It says that John spake and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And what did Jesus say? He said, Forbid not any. For he who is not against us is for us. And I want you to think about that on your own. And that brings me to another testimony. My family and I like to spend our vacations down in Eminence, Missouri. And I don't know if any of you have been down there. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's mountainous. It's got crystal clear streams and rivers down there that we like to swim in and fish in. So we spend our time, now, time down there. And while we're there, we stay on the property of Linda and Greg Walker. And Linda was my partner for many years on the police force. And I can tell you, she is tougher than boot leather and meaner than the Tasmanian devil. And she, I mean, she's about so tall, about so tall. But she is. Any men have a wife like that? I won't tell you if mine is. But anyway, Linda and Greg attend an evangelical church down there in a small town that has less than a population of 350 people. But I consider their church to be a mega church because of the number of people that they draw in from all over the area. This is 
about an hour and 15 minutes from Ava, is that about right? And they draw people from there. So they are so large that they have to have multiple services on Sunday mornings because the sanctuary is too small to fit them all in there. What a problem to have, right? And this is even after they spent about $2 million on an enormous expansion for the church. They still have to break up the services to attend to the needs of all of the people down there. And you know what's funny is down there, the annual income is under $50,000. And you know what? They paid for that expansion, $2 million, through their tithes and offerings in just over a year. Imagine that. Just over a year. We've had the pleasure of attending several services down there, and I can tell you without a doubt, saints, they're God's people too. Right, Ray? They're God's people too. Some of them did give us a sideways glance when we came in, but that's because Greg is always heckling me and telling people that we're Mormons. But they've been very gracious and they've been very loving towards us, and you want, some, you want to hear some poetic justice. It wasn't just a few months ago, Greg found out that his extended family are Book of Mormon believers. And I don't let him forget it. But I gotta say, I've enjoyed the messages that the pastor has presented down there because they've been very thoughtful. They've been grounded in the scriptures. They've just lacked a little bit in the depths of the spirit. But that's not to diminish them in any way in saying that because they're doing a wonderful work. Katrina and I love how involved all of their membership is. All of them are involved in some way whether it's caring for the grounds or, or the facilities, whether it's caring for the sick or families in need, they all do something. They're involved in all kinds of community outreach in communities outside of their own, and they're involved in all kinds of stuff for kids. It's great, it's kingdom behavior, and I appreciate that very much. The one thing that I, I I wish is that they would give me an opportunity. And I have had an opportunity to speak to the pastor. We've shared some time together over at Linda and Greg's house. But I long for that opportunity to speak to his congregation. I wish he would give me that invitation so I could share with them my testimony of the fullness of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. I would really, really enjoy doing that. And I gotta tell you, I've attended Baptist services and Catholic services too, and regardless of their church experience or their knowledge, they're God's people too. We've gotta remember that their beliefs are founded on creeds that go back many, many generations, hundreds of years. So if they have any prejudice towards us or any other faiths, it's something that they were taught, right? It's something they were taught. So we have no right to condemn them. What we need to do instead is learn how to engage in apologetic ministry with them. And in order to do that, we've got to come to some understanding of what their basic beliefs are. And then when you understand that and you have an opportunity to share with one of them, then you start with things that we agree on and you let the Holy Spirit work. You don't contend with them over things that you don't agree on. That's the last thing you want to do. Instead, acknowledge their point of view and open the scriptures together and let the Word of God testify why we believe what we believe. That's how you reason with one another, but there again is the importance of studying so that you know the Scriptures and you can testify, so that you know where to look in the Scriptures to find what it is that you need to share with them on the topic that you're discuss discussing. But what I want you to remember out of this message, above all things, is that the world it's growing in sin. It is starving for light and truth. It is starving for hope. The need for spiritual food and the treasures that the Lord has entrusted to us is greater than at any time. We can't just hide that for ourselves. It is time for us to focus on the mission that we've been given and help the Lord break this spiritual famine. But again, that requires us to study to develop our relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, when I went through my conversion experience and I devoured the scriptures and everything I could get my hands on because I had to know who this God was that forgave me and delivered me from my guilt, he filled me with such a measure of his spirit that I could not 
help but speak of his good name. I could not help but declare his salvation. I could not help but quote scriptures with people when I met them. I didn't have to try. That's what the Spirit will do for you. If you will engage in seeking him out with full purpose of heart. Set your affection, saints, on heavenly things and not on the things of the earth. We talked about that a little bit in this class that we had this morning. But above all, love one another. Forgive one another. Show mercy toward one another. That is our duty. That is our duty. And I'm going to close with the same scriptures that I read in the beginning. I want you to keep in mind the scripture reading that was brought by President Patience as well. Beware lest you be deceived. And that you may not be deceived, seek ye earnestly the best gifts, always remembering for what they are given. Sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer with meekness and fear to every man that seeketh from you the reason for the hope that is in you. And I pray that you receive this in Jesus' name. We have had an opportunity to certainly hear an invitation to uh, spend time with him in our personal lives. And I wish to thank Brother Baker for sharing with us this morning. As we contemplate our congregational life together, and before we sing the final hymn, I would like to remind us all that it's 4.30 this afternoon. There is a priesthood meeting, and that is for all priesthood, according to Brother Gates. And we are inviting also all women. And I understand from what he told me that there is a youth activity to uh, go along with that. And then to uh, join us together even more in fellowship, there's a potluck at 5.30. So it sounds like we could have a, a wonderful afternoon of continuing our opportunity to worship and to be together and to share in uh, the life of those of us who are believers as we try to strengthen ourselves and become even stronger and better prepared to share that life with others. We will sing hymn number 110, after which uh, Brother Joshua Patterson will give us our benediction for the service.
Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you at the conclusion of this service, thankful for the message that uh, you placed on Brother Will's heart. We'd ask that you would be with us as we go forward into this world and are aware of the, the battle that's taking place, the spiritual battle that uh, Brother Will warned us of, and that we understand that we're not to make enemies of our allies and that that would be placed on our heart, Lord, and that seed that was planted would grow, and we would look at those as our brother and as allies. And the greatest ally that we have, Lord, is your son, Jesus, and that we would recognize that and give all that we have to him. These things we ask in your son's holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> 